Okay, we are recording. Good morning, everybody. This is a, a new challenge that uh, we are going in live at the IAEA in the Salon de Actos and in Zoom at the same time. So thank you very much, uh, Martin, for accepting this challenge. <laughs> and let's see how, how it's going. So today, we will have the seminar by Dr. Uh, Martin Guerrero, and he will talk about seeing the unseen in planetary nebula with high dispersion integral film spectroscopy. Okay, I think I have this there, which is the, <laughs> so let's just begin the show. Now you can see me, now you can listen to me, hope so, just 20 minutes, not bad. Okay, so I'm gonna try to tell you uh, the work that uh, my team and I are doing um, using high dispersion integral field spectroscopy for the observation of planetary nebulae. There are many people working together in this thing, but I would like to emphasize very particularly, uh, let's see here, uh, Borja, which is my PhD student, and Jacqueline, uh, who was a former postdoc here at this center. So planetary nebula aren't that easy any longer. Uh, for uh, some time, we consider them to be just a ball of gas that were ejected by AGB stars at the very end of their life. So most of the stars in, in our galaxy, low and in the intermediate mass stars are going to end their lives as planetary nebula. And for some 20 to 30,000 years, they are going to expand and disperse into the interstellar medium. So we consider them to be just round shells of material that we are going to, to expand. But now when we become getting much better images, we see a lot of a structure there. For instance, we see here the effects of the, uh, of the stellar winds and photoionization, which is breaking completely the structure of this, uh, both the shell and this kind, kind of um, precession material uh, there, like a, sp a spiral uh, structure. We see shells within shells that we see here in this case, and with also with some material, with some low ionization material inside. Sometimes we even see jets that they are just piercing through the material like here in the uh, cat's eye uh, nebula, we see those jets that they are just going through those kind of shells that they are the last gasp of the uh, mass loss during the AGB phase. And in some cases, we just see something like butterfly shapes. It's not just a shell, but something like completely bipolar with a waist there, which is basically focusing the material along the main axis of those sources. Those, of course, are just images. We see a 3D structure, which is being projected onto the plane of the sky. And so projection effects are going to be very important. This is a very typical case of Shapley one, which looks like a round PN. So everything would say, well, this is just a round spherical shell. But when we look at the kinematics, actually what we see is that this is a kind of bipolar structure, something like this, which is seen almost pole on with an inclination angle of about 10 degrees. So what we see on the sky actually could be very deceiving. And what about when we have a lot of structures in these sources? Oh, this is the Saturn nebula. And you can imagine that it's going to be very different the morphology that we see here if we were looking from this direction, or if we were looking almost polo. So in this case, we can even think that maybe those uh, low initiation structures that are uh, depicted here in, in red colors, we may not even detect those when they are projected against the bright nebular shell. And indeed, when we made a compilation of all the outflows in planetary nebulae, and we compare their sizes with those of the, of the nebula, we saw that there was a missing number of collimated outflows close to the central star, which is 
here, this is just the linear size, but we, when we were comparing with the radius of the source, so the radius is one here, and we see that there is a lot of collimated outflows that they are not projected against the nebular shell. And this is, even if we do the statistics, because the, the different uh, angles that we are going to consider, there is still a number of outflows that they are missing that we should be seeing in projection there against the, the nebular shell. So what we have been doing in the last years is using high dispersion integral field spectroscopy to investigate the properties of some of those planetary nebulae. Integral field spectroscopy is becoming really a game changer in planetary nebular research. Uh, in 2008, Sanding was using it to investigate the very low surface bright brightness of the halos of planetary nebula, just because uh, integral field units has a larger collecting area on the sky. But more recently, Robert Walsh and Anna Monreal Ibero are using them to investigate the 2D uh, excitation, the 2D um, abundances of different planetary nebula. And they are seeing, for instance, that extinction could be varying within the, uh, the, the, the phase of the PN that we see in projection. And this is something very interesting because we are really separating, dissecting the different components of those planetary nebulae. More recently, Danekar has been using high dispersion uh, integral field spectroscopy to even reveal the physical 3D structure of planetary nebula. And this is something that we have been starting to play using GTC uh, Megara. Megara in particular has a high dispersion grating in the H alpha and nitrogen two uh, spectral range that provides a, a, a velocity resolution of 15 kilometer per second. This is good enough to resolve the fastest component of planetary nebulae. And in particular, we have been using the IFUNI with uh, 567 fibers with a shape uh, hexagonal with a size of 0.6 arc seconds approximately. So using these tools, we have been doing the different works. And in particular here, I'm going to focus on three different. One led by Jacqueline on, on a fast outflow in the PN HUBI1. Another one led by her on a very compact planetary nebula, uh, this 31st uh, source in the second catalog of Minkowski, that is M2-31. And finally, one that was led by me on the jet in the NGC 2392, the Schemo Nebula. HUBA1 has become a very popular recently, since we claim in 2018 that it could be one of the very few PN which is a born again planetary nebula. Uh, we, ha we have several observations that were pointing along this direction and we published them. And since then, the object has become uh, very popular in the in PN research. We found in this source that the low ionization emission, which is typically seen in planetary nebula here in the outside, as revealed by the natural two emission, we see here in red, or we see here in red. But in the case of HUBI1, which is this source, Actually, this low ionization emission is inside the PN, it's closer to the central star, which is something that was completely uh, unexpected. This is not typical for photo ionized uh, nebula. Then we realized that the star has been dimming in the last 50 years by 10 magnitudes, which is a lot. So basically, the star has disappeared from the view. And finally, we also realized that it has a helium 2 emission, which is difficult to believe because the star has an effective temperature of about 30,000 Kelvin, which is not enough to photogenize the material. So based on this uh, piece of evidence, and also on uh, some evidence for so excitation in the inner shell, uh, the recombination of the outer shell, uh, we see a lot of uh, dust uh, emission from there with a lot of carbon lines, we made a, a hypothesis that this is a carbon rich high speed ejecta that occurred about 50 years ago. And this is completely consistent with what's called a very late thermal pulse or a born again event. So basically 
the star, when, once that it leaves the AGB phase here, it goes along this horizontal track and then enter the cooling track of the white dwarf. But at this time, the star is going to build a helium layer with a critical mass enough to produce the fusion of helium into carbon and oxygen. This is a thermal pulse. It happens during the AGB phase. During the AGB phase, you have all the envelope of the star around it. And so this is going to make this pool something like mild. But when you don't have this uh, envelope, this is going to be a very explosive event. So in a very short period of time, the star is going to convert this helium into carbon and oxygen. And the star itself is going to go back to the phase of the, to the uh, region of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of AGB stars here. And then it goes back again with the uh, horizontal track and finally the cooling uh, track for the white dwarf. In a sense, the PN is born again. So there is a new PN inside the old PN. What we were expecting? Well, if this is really a born again ejecta, then we have fast material moving there and we have material which has chemical abundances, which are hydrogen poor. So to prove this, two different uh, properties. We have obtained uh, Megara observations of the uh, HUBI1. In this first paper by uh, Jacqueline, we examined, we investigated the properties of the nitrogen 2 emission. So we, here you see the velocity profile of the nitrogen 2 emission, and you see that there is winds with high velocity there. So we make, we like different, uh, Isovelocity velocity uh, images that you see here going from the um, say systemic velocity to the red and to the blue. And so we realize here that there is ejecta moving at the speeds of about 200 kilometers per second that has been ejected some 100 or 200 years ago. So it, it really depends on what's the, the bulk velocity of the material to make this number. But this is also consistent with the idea that there was a recent uh, born again event here. So more recently, we have been trying to determine what are the chemical abundances of this object. This is very difficult because when you have a multiple shell planetary nebula, you typically have much brighter emission inside than outside. So in this case, if you take the spectrum of the uh, innermost region, it has some contamination from the outermost layers, but this is very small. And in most cases, it could be considered negligible. But here, in the case of HUBI1, we have that in the case of the Balmer lines, the outer region is much brighter than the inner region. And so you cannot neglect the contribution from the outer layer to the spectrum of the inner shell. And indeed, when you, here we have a spatial profile of the nitrogen 2 line. You see that it peaks in the central region. But as for the H alpha, sorry. But as for the H alpha, you see that most of the emission comes from the outer shell here. And there is some bump of emission here and there that correspond really to the H alpha emission from the inner shell. This is very difficult to, to excise. But using uh, high dispersion integral field spectroscopy, actually we can dissect the different velocity components. So for instance, here, we uh, obtain images in the oxygen three line and the helium two line of the innermost, innermost region. So here in particular, the oxygen three is used to define those contours where we see the emission from the inner shell. And when we compare to the helium two, we actually see that indeed there is an uh, ionization inverted structure in here. So helium two is outside the oxygen three, which is I likely in, in planetary nebula. And we can also use the different velocity of the uh, ejecta and the main nebula to separate the emission from the shell, from the outer shell and the inner shell. So here we have the, uh, sorry, the uh, H alpha profile, and we can get the blue wing and the red wing to obtain images in H alpha. Or we can even be a bit more sophisticated and make a spectral fit here with different Gaussian components 
to obtain the emission from the red and the blue components. And when we do this, we indeed can separate the H alpha emission from the inner shell here and H alpha emission from the outer shell. So in this way, we can really measure what are the H alpha, H beta, the Balmer emission line, which is are critical to determine chemical abundances, but also for instance, extinction. When we compare the extinction as determined from the H alpha to H beta ratio for the inner shell and the outer shell, we actually see that the inner shell has larger extinction than the inner shell. So indeed, there is a dusty component there in the inner shell, which is not seen in the outer shell. We can also look at uh, BPT diagrams to see at the excitation of the material. And again, when we look at those ratio for uh, the different components for the outer region and the inner region, we see that the outer region is consistent with uh, photoionization, but the outer region is completely inconsistent. It, it really requires a shock excitation. At this moment, uh, Borja is doing the, the calculation for the chemical abundances. Actually, uh, Borja Perez Diaz is also helping him for doing this task using mapping, which is the, the code for shock. And we are finding evidence that the uh, uh, chemical abundances indeed are a uh, hydrogen bulk, which is consistent with the born again event. Then I move to this compact PN and to the 31, which is known as a spectroscopy bipolar nebula. So when you look at the image, you see nothing, but when you look at the spectra, you see really a fast velocity component there. It hosts a WC46 central star, a wolf rajet central star, which is a wolf rajet with square brackets because it actually is not a massive star. It's the central star of a planetary nebula, but in the spectrum is similar to that of wolf rajet massive stars. And also there is some interesting features with the nebula. It has a dual dust chemistry, both carbon and oxygen, and what's called an abundance discrepancy factor of 2.4. So when you compare the chemical abundances derived from the recombination lines and from forbidden lines, there is a very different uh, abundances. So the fact that it has dual dust chemistry may imply that the nebula was oxygen rich and at some moment there was an injection of carbon rich material, material inside there. So, uh, and that could correspond to some kind of, probably not a very late thermal pulse, but a late thermal pulse when there was the moment when the star moved into this WC uh, status. So we have used Megara. Megara has this field of view when we plot inside uh, on top of the nebula and we have found five different uh, kinematical, spatial kinematical components here. We have, uh, so this is the flux and the velocity. So we have one receiving outflow at a fast velocity, one approaching outflow. And you see that actually the outflow is not going uh, along this direction where it can be seen that there is some kind of uh, outflow, but it's actually going along this direction. So really the fast outflow here is along this direction not that one. We also see that there are two components from the shell, the one which is approaching us and, and receiving. And then at the innermost region here, we see that there is a kind of low velocity Torola-like component, which is embedded within the, the nebula. One interesting thing is that we have not only made this uh, analysis with the nitrogen two line, but also with the recombination carbon two line. And when we use the recombination carbon two line, actually we see that there is like a kind of inner most shell there, which has a smaller velocities than the outer most regions, and which is more compact. So here you can see the different components over plot on the, on the image. So you see the outflow going along this direction. You see the shell there and this kind of toroidal components. And when you look at the, carbon two line is embedded in, in, in there. So our next step is going to be obtaining also this kind of observation for the oxygen two and nitrogen two recombination lines in the blue. 
and then look at the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen abundances of this PM to see whether the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen ratios are consistent with a very late thermal pulse or, or a late thermal pulse. There is more coming. Uh, Jacqueline has found one object, which is this one, where we have one of the fastest outflows in a, in a PM. So this is like a, a position velocity uh, diagram derived from the uh, Megara observation. And we see that there is one component here and another there. So probably if we made a correction for inclination effects, those outflows are moving at velocities larger than 300 or 400 kilometers per, per second. And then I move to my, my baby, NGC 2392, the Schimo Nebula, and which is very peculiar. This was actually the very first PN with a fat, fast outflow. In, 1985, uh, G.C. King and collaborator described a jet-like multi-node bipolar mass flow with a velocity of nearly 200 kilometers per second. That was the very first on, on a pin. So here, this is the shell observation, and you can see the nitrogen two lines, the shell fall line, and you see this component here and there that move at very fast speed. And this is an outflow which is going along approximately this direction. So this is a very peculiar PN. The, the inner shell is expanding at 90 kilometers per second, which is very unusual for a planetary nebula, for the central, for the inner shell of a planetary nebula. You find these velocities in bipolar PN, but never in the in the in, in a shell of a PN. And in addition, the central star is too wimpy. It does not have the UV flux or the temperature to produce the large amount of helium-2 emissions seen there. As a result, the effective temperature as determined from non-healthy uh, models, and this that correspond to Sanstra models is completely discrepant. It's much, much higher for the Sanstra temperature. And also, if we look at the X-ray emission, Okay, so this is the X-ray emission here from the, from the diffuse emission inside the, the inner shell. It has an X-ray temperature that cannot be produced by the stellar wind of the central star. The stellar wind is too slow. It has a velocity of 300 kilometers per second, which cannot produce even in the case of an adiabatic shock, which is the, the most efficient that we can imagine, it cannot produce the plasma temperature, which is in, in there. In addition, we see that the emission from the, from the central star, so this is the emission from the central star here, multiplied by 10, it's this blue, but multiplied by 10. And we see that this is really peaking at 0.9 kilo electron volt, with a tail that extends down to three kilo electron, electron volts. This is unseen in any a central star of planetary nebula. So there is something going on there. And actually there are many authors, and I, I'm among them, that we believe that this is really a post-common envelope double degeneracy binary. So this is the central star of the PN, which is now evolving into the wide world phase. And there is an unseen, a very small, very compact wide world Star with probably a temperature of 200,000 Kelvin, which is really providing the ionizing power to the to this source. Uh, because we see also next ray modulation, uh, probably there is some kind of uh, of accretion onto uh, an accretion disk. At this moment, there are different periods depending on the on the lines that you see on the spectrum of the star, and also the X ray modulation. So the period of this binary system is really quite unknown, but there is something there going on there. Now we can tell if there is a star which is still a creative material, is going the jet to be still collimated? Actually, when we look at position velocity maps, here we see that the jet actually goes down all the way to the uh, continuum of the star. So it seems that the jet is emanating from the jet central star at this moment. And that would make an active jet in a post-common envelope PN, which would be the only one. But when we try to see the jet in direct images, see this is, this is the nitrogen two uh, position velocity diagram. You see the jet here. 
very nicely. But because the nebular shell is very bright, when you go to images, you don't see the jet here. There is, uh, and also there is a lot of uh, uh, structure, definition components there. So it's, it's not possible to, to find where the jet is. Some authors have made some uh, isovelocity images using many long slits and then making um, interpolation between what we see in the shell observation with those long slits. So in particular, uh, Bruce Balick in 1987, they found some emission here in the most extreme isovelocity channels that could be, could be associated with the, with the jet. But it was difficult from there to derive what's the exact morphology of the object. Um, more recently, uh, Maria Teresa Garcia Diaz also made observation in a lot, in a lot of uh, long slits there, and she produces some maps of the jet. So actually, the jet seems to be not really full collimated, but it has some structure. So with this idea in mind, we have obtained, uh, I think it's 15 uh, observations of the, uh, of the schema because the schema is much larger than the field of view of, of Megara. We mapped it, we made a, a mosaic, and actually in 15 of these fields, we were detecting the, the jet. So the jet is detected in thousands of, of spaxels. And we can really resolve because the high velocity of the jet we can resolve the jet from the nebular emission. And this is shown here. So we have the jet in this particular case, in this particular region, it's to the red. And we can make an image of the jet. And here, this is the emission in the, from the nebula at most, uh, mostly uh, systemic velocities. And then we have a different image here. So, Playing this game for the whole uh, field of view, we have made these uh, maps of the emission of the jet in the schema. So here we have the flux and the velocity and velocity dispersion in the nitrogen two line. And we also have the flux in the sulfur two lines and the density. For the H alpha, we could produce these maps also for what we call the mid jet and the, and the outer jet, but actually for the inner jet, which is projected against the, the bright nebular shell, which has, has also a fast uh, expansion, we could re not resolve the H alpha from this line. So we, we stopped, we, we didn't try to make a full map of the, of the H alpha. So how does the jet compare with the, with the nebula? Well, first thing is that we see that the jet really emanates from the central star. It goes, across the inner shell and it gets outside the inner shell. So it's really going across the, the, the edge of the inner shell. And when we compare it with the outer nebula, then we see that the jet actually, it has some kind of um, like precession like motion there and it even extends outside the nebula. So here and there is projected against the nebula, but we see clearly here and there that it goes beyond the limits of the nebula. So there is no really connection between the jet and the, and the nebula. So using the spatial kinematical property, well, sorry. Uh, I see that we could not see the jet, but now that we have this map of the jet, we could actually see that there was something. If we look at the sulfur two images, there was something, some emission there and there, and maybe some, uh, ratio of nitrogen two to oxygen three. So we see that the jet is there, but actually without the evidence of this special uh, kinematically resolved jet, it would have been impossible to really say that this is the jet in the, in the schema. So these properties that they mm, look like those of precession jet, mm, we have modeled this using a very simple uh, model, like a, like a toy with an, a precession jet there. And actually they fit very well, the, what we are observing. So we see that the jet is really go wobbling here. And when we look at the position velocity map, we see here the um, best fit model is here in, in, in black. 
and those are like different models with different parameters. So in order to, to determine what are the, uh, the uncertainties. So with this information, we have been able to derive the properties of the jet. For instance, we know now that the precession jet is something like 3000 uh, year, the inclination of the precession angle is 33 de degrees. The full linear size of the jet is about, it's more than two times larger than the uh, diameter of the, of the inner shell there. And it's older. So the, the jet was emitted before the nebula was created. Also, we see that there are some discrepancies as for the mass loss rate or, or accretion rate. So again, the central star cannot produce, the, cannot provide the mass to produce the jet. So there is something on additionally going there. And there is some evidence that maybe the, the fast stellar wind from the central star is not isotropic, but it could be something like uh, to have some uh, preferential uh, direction, like a bipolar uh, outflow that actually could be even the, the very beginning, the onset of the jet emerging from the central star, what has been actually detected. When we compare the jet, in the schema nebula with those on post common envelope PN jets. Uh, we see here in most of the cases, for instance, this one, the necklace, we see that the jet is here and there. So there is no connection between the jet and the central star. And this is also happening here in all the sources. And also for Fleming one, for instance, the jet goes down there and then there, but there is no connection. So this is actually, the post common envelope jet in the schema is the only one where the jet is at this moment being collimated and launched. Of course, we know that this is something that happens for um, AGB stars, like this one, post AGB star, or very young planetary nebula. So this, those are still able to collimate the jet because probably the mass loss rate from the AGB phase is large enough to accrete enough material to produce the jet, but this is not the case for uh, those post-common envelope jets. There are many similarities between the jet of the schema and that one of uh, Fleming one. So we see for instance, that in the case of Fleming one, there is an envelope that we see uh, projected on the sky, but in the case of the Eskimo it's probably like face on. It's like we see, we see like a pole on, view of the of the envelope. There is like a low ionization features in the Fleming one that uh, we see clearly that this is a kind of ruin like structure that we see on projection on the sky on the on the Eskimo. Um, so one can see here the model that may uh, Maria Teresa Garcia Diaz of this source that actually correspond quite nicely to uh, to what can be seen here in this other case. So we are kind of uh, launching the, the idea of proposing that Fleming 1 and NGC 2392 are very similar sources, but seen from different point of views. And also in the case of Fleming 1, this is like a, a bit later when we are observing this source because the, the outflow is not being collimated at this uh, moment, but it is in the case of, of the schema. So we published these results uh, very recently in the in the astrophysical journal. Um, so we uh, also conclude here that the, the case for a launching of the jet at this moment, it's also telling us that there is um, a double degenerate system which is undergoing accretion. And just to conclude some very basic uh, ideas that uh, high dispersion integral field spectroscopic observations of planetary nebula helped us a lot to determine what's the physical structure of the PN to see what are the different components, the inclination of the system. And this is particularly interesting in the case of compact PN, where different components are merged because we don't have the spatial resolution, but the spatial and velocity resolution are going to help us to distinguish these different components. It could also be used to see outflows that they are projected against very bright nebular shells. And as in the case of HUBI1, if you really want to determine the properties, uh, the, the physical properties, the physical conditions, excitation, uh, extinction, and chemical abundances of 
weak uh, faint clumps of material embedded within the shell, you really need to go to this kind of observation to separate the spatial kinematically these components, this weak component from the uh, bright nebular shell. So I think that there is a, a, a lot that can be made with this kind of observation that we are applying to planetary nebula. And we are also now moving to nova shells, to nova remnants, to, so, because they also have very high uh, velocities and we can see the different components of those shells. Thank you very much. Now I'm happy to take any, any questions. Yeah, thank you, Martin. And uh, let's try the, the new system of the question here live or remotely. So please, if you have a question, raise your real hand here. Uh, uh, remote. Uh, yeah. You have a the mobile with the location. No. I didn't know what I could do that. Uh, Renee's mobile. <laughs> Well, you know that the Megara field of view is small, it's something like 12 by uh, 11 uh, arc seconds. This x axel is 0.6, so you are going really to depend on it's going to be a convolution between the scene that you have and the uh, size of the of this pixel. We are typically applying for those sources for seeing below one arc second. And in these cases, we, we have made some measurements of the full width and maximum of stars in the field of view. And we can say that we have something like one arc second, 1.1, 1.2, up to, up to most. Yeah, because it's good that you can resolve in velocity when you have high dispersion. But it mm. may also help to have a higher spatial resolution. Mm. So do you have any plans of improving your uh, information on information uh, by asking for data coming from places where the spatial resolution is expected to be higher? Yeah, in, indeed, we have a, a, a project. Uh, let me see, too. Actually, uh, Sarah and I have had applied for Muse observation of uh, Fleming One, because now we have too many details of the Eskimo Nebula and properties of the of the of the mass, uh, period, um, age. But as for Fleming One, because it's very large and it's difficult to trace with just a long slit, there is a very uh, few observation. There is one thing which is very important. When you made observation with long slit with the shell, it's almost impossible to get the flux calibration properly. But when you're using this kind of observation, that's very straightforward. And Fleming one actually fits very nicely in several Muse fields. And also, also Muse does not have the spectral resolution of Megara. In this case, we are talking about a jet which has been moving at 100 kilometers per second with respect to the, to the nebula. So in this case, we are sacrificing a bit the uh, spectral information, but we are getting much better spatial information. So we hope to be able to, pr to produce the same kind of models for this source as we have for the, for the Eskimo. Okay. Yes, thank you. Well, welcome. So we have enough questions here, Pedro. Go on. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Thanks, Martin, for a nice, a nice talk uh, that I have enjoyed. I always enjoyed enjoy these these talks that you guys give because of the very nice pictures I can always <laughs> see in them. Um, I, I have a, a couple of related questions. I, I want to start asking you um, about these this late thermal pulses or very late thermal pulses that happen in mm -hmm. these stars. I understand mm -hmm. that they do not occur in all stars, uh, all post AGB stars. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe in a fraction of them. What what drives these events in these stars that is that is not there in the other stars that that, that 
that don't have them. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, the the very last, yeah, uh, Peter is asking whether the those very late thermal pulses are going to happen in all, uh, let's say, uh, post AGB stars or only in a fraction of AGB, uh, post AGB stars, and in, if so, uh, what's really uh, driving this uh, this event? So when the star leaves the AGB. It's going to have. It's going to be basically a core of carbon and oxygen, and then there is going to be a layer of helium, and on top of that is going to be another heat layer of hydrogen. So in this uh, horizontal region of the hertz russell diagram that the star is crossing during the PM phase, the star is burning hydrogen on the top of the on the uh, superficial on the surface layer, and this hydrogen is going to uh, produce an increase of the mass of the helium layer. So in most of the cases, the helium layer is going to be, uh, it's going to have a small mass and nothing is going to happen. Let's say for maybe 80% of the, of the post-AGB stars, nothing is going to happen. But for some 20 of them, the initial mass of the helium layer is close to the critical mass. When this critical mass is reached because the helium on top of them is producing more helium, then the helium is going to ignite and it's going to produce this uh, thermal pulse. So it may happen at the very end of the AGB phase, what's called a final thermal pulse. And then the, the PN is ejected during this final thermal pulse. It may happen while the star is in, on this horizontal track, and this is called a uh, late thermal pulse. And it may happen when the star has already be begin to, to cool down the, the cooling uh, track. And this is a very late thermal pulse. We consider that this is what actually produces all the wolf rigid tight central star of planet Nibli. So those are Central star whose which, whose atmosphere are basically depleted of hydrogen, and so they have an spectrum which is similar to those of world rated massive stars. Um, those are about fifteen percent of the of the central star of planetary nebula. And so that's why I'm saying that maybe something like twenty to twenty percent are those the stars that they are going to uh, to suffer to experience this. Uh, late or very late thermal pools to become born again planetary nuclear. But this is a very um, short transitional phase. It's going to be, it's going to last for a few hundred years and it's going to depend on whether uh, the, out, uh, the out, outer nebula is, is very tenuous, it's very old, then you are going to be able to identify very clearly the signature of a born again event but if it happened while the nebula is compact and dense, and then it's difficult, it's, it, it's quite difficult to identify that there is an inclusion of uh, hydrogen deficient material there. So that's something actually that this kind of observation can help us to, to distinguish. And we have a sample of sources selected from their uh, infrared properties that are very good candidates to have experienced this kind of, of events. So uh, just just to finish with my questions, um, with, my, with my question. So so uh, once this event happens, uh, mm -hmm. from your answer, I take that there is no way of differentiating between uh, one of these stars as a as a white dwarf that has not gone through this event from one that is coming from the born again phase and, and coming back to the to the war, uh, white dwarf stage. Is that correct? Uh, no, no, actually it's not. When, when this event happened, the, the chemical composition of the surface of the star goes from hydrogen rich or helium rich mm. to carbon and oxygen rich. So there is a, a, a variation. And then we have these two different kind of, of uh, central star with some ob objects in, in between. There. But actually, we, we consider that this is something that really changes dramatically the chemical composition on the surface of the star. Surface, okay. 
Okay, thanks, Martin. Mm -hmm. Welcome. We have some problems. The the people online they they cannot hear the question. So, I'm not hear the question. Okay, uh, I can add. Uh, no. Marisa Vargas uh, say that uh, 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 she didn't touch the evolution. In the the evolution. Sorry. It's moving. As the slit is at the exit of each fiber. Um, so that the spectral animation with maximum is guaranteed. A different mm -hmm. is the flux calibration where you uh, will have to add RGB spectrums and take into consideration. This is a question for a comment. So she, she's implying that you can make some kind of the convolution of the images to, because uh, it wasn't clear to me what, what she was asking. Uh, hello, can I, can I say? Yes, yeah, yes, please. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Martin. Thank you very much for the talk. No, it was just a comment because I didn't hear the question. I don't know. If from whom uh, about convolution and about mm. the spectral resolution and the point is that with Megara you don't have the problem of convolving mm. with scene because the spectral resolution mm. you get mm. is exactly the same whatever the scene is another thing is yeah. how much flux you have in each fiber mm. So yeah, yeah. In, in that regard, you have to take into account the spaxel on the on the overall image on the eye view. But mm. for the spectral resolution, this is a great advantage of fibers that it is always the same. So you are not losing the details. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I quite I quite agree. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether I was clear before, but basically, the spectral resolution, it's uh, it's excellent. Like it doesn't not we, we have we haven't seen that it changed across the field of view. So that, uh, that um, it provides us with a very nice uh, piece of uh, a tool to, to work. As for the spatial resolution, well, because the spaxel size, is quite similar to the, to the scene that we are requesting. So actually there is some convolution between the, the size of the spaxel and, and the scene. But basically mm, what we see in our images is the original scene. It just degraded by a few percent. So there is no, no major issue on, on this. We are close to the Nyquist uh, criterion for, for this. As for the spatial resolution. So I have a question about Mayra, but I don't know if it's answered. Hi, Martin. Thank you very much for this nice talk. I mm, had a you. question regarding the planetary nebula M2 and 31. You mentioned mm -hmm. that you have detected an outflow asteroid component with Megara. I mm. wonder if you had plans to confirm or to see these components also in radio. Do you plan to propose a radio observation with large interferometers to see these uh, uh, these components associated well, with this nebula. Well, that that could be interesting. At this moment, I don't have uh, this in mind, but because uh, oh, okay, repeat the question. Okay, sorry. So Mayra was asking whether the the collimated outflow and the toroidal component that we see in M two thirty one that we see in the optical. If we have in mind to uh, propose a radio observation, a more more precisely radio interferometric observation to, to see those. Well, at this moment, uh, we are quite busy with some uh, radio interferometric observation of a born again a PN, Abel 58. Um, well, this is a very good idea, but we, uh, we, we need manpower uh, basically to, to do that, but it would be mm, interesting to see those bipolar outflows that they are. My impression is that because those are compact sources, 
those are also young sources. And so in this case, we are see, really seeing the, the early collimation of the outflow when the density is going to be high enough and maybe there is some, who knows, singleton emission or, or radio emission from uh, free free uh, electrons. So that could be something interesting. And I, I should ask uh, Jesus Tola, who is leading this line to, to propose this observation. Thank you for the yes, idea. I I only want to comment that okay. there is a lot of pressure Another to get one, time with yeah. Alma. Yeah, I know. So she's saying that there is a lot of pressure to get time with, with but Alma. But we can propose with Noema or with this millimeter array, which is more, which mm -hmm. is easier to get. <laughs> okay, let's let's uh, uh, let's make uh, let's think about it, and we can see whether there is anything on the on the archives to see whether there is radio emission, and based on this, we can make some. Proposal. Good, excellent. Pedro? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, sorry, I, uh, if uh, someone else asks uh, a question, I can wait. Um, otherwise, I can, I can go with my last question. Uh, Martin, um, mm -hmm. well, we all know that recently a Jupiter site plan has been detected around the white dwarf, so we are just starting to confirm that the planet survived the last stages of hmm. a stellar evolution. Um, I hope we can have to do uh, a say on, on this soon. Um, hmm. So um, I, I, I understand that if a planet um, orbiting far from the, from the star is finding a denser environment when it is hmm. embedded in the you know, in the ejecta, in the ejected envelope of the star, it may migrate inwards or outwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so does this the presence of of, of a long period planet, giant planet, uh, um, can it can it have a, a, an effect on the building of structures in in planetary nebulae? Mm -hmm. Uh, Pedro is asking me that because there has been the recent detection of a Jupiter-like planet around a white dwarf. So that there is evidence that planets, that the planetary systems are going to survive the AGB and planetary nebula phase, uh, because depending on the evolution, planets are going to migrate either inwards or, or outwards. He's asking me whether those planets are expected to, to become a piece of, uh, for the building of the planetary nebula, for building of those uh, structure. And actually there is a lot of work in this respect from the um, a theoretical point of view. There is a lot of simulation trying to find what are the, let's say, the a small size of the body around an AGB star, which is going to, to change the, uh, the velocity field of the of the mass loss, so as to produce some kind of, for instance, equatorial enhancement of density, or some kind of bipolar outflow, so as to produce the shaping of the planetary nebula. And indeed, it seems that depending on the properties, that maybe a Jupiter-like planet at the right position from the AGB star is going to be able to produce mild effects on the uh, on the symmetry of the outcoming planetary nebula. Thanks, Martin. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pedro. Okay. If uh, there is no more questions, I really apologize for these uh, technical problems. We need to improve some some stuff, and I think in the next seminar we can we can do it better. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin, for this talk, and thank you all for, for the presentation. I think we just want to say something. Oh no, just thanks. <laughs> thank you, Pepe. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. Great talk. Yeah, actually, I think that it's really very amazing, very uh, to to be here with people around to be able to see the, the faces, but also to be on broadcast through, through Zoom so that you know that we have a, a larger uh, audience. Yeah. And thank you very much, René, for the- And for thank the you, to René, also for this experiment. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>